ironically we are we are reacting to asmund gold here wokeness in video games i'm really interested to know what he has to say on it i love that he doesn't give a shit and uses like this camera that you can like barely see what's going on wokeness in video games this has been a very popular topic for uh -huh. the past couple of weeks and let's be honest it's true been a popular topic for the last decade and today, I want to talk about why it's a popular topic. It wasn't and really, like, that bad, like, 10 years ago, though. What I think that concern actually indicates for a larger relationship that developers have with players. And I think that's really what... I like Leaflet's anti-left arc. I'm not really anti-left. I'm anti-stupid. There... The problem lies. I think that the issue that people have with wokeness is actually not the... I'm anti-stupid and anti-bullshit. Like a lot of a lot of the a lot I don't really think I mean sure you could say that a lot of it is co-opted but like a lot of this like like kind of hostile takeover of people using left and left and right in order to like get gamers pissed off and stuff like you could say that but I I honestly don't care I'm clearly friends with a lot of left people, and I'm clearly friends with a lot of right people. It has nothing to do with that. Three years with the slime leaflet heart. Leaflet backtracking for sponsors? What sponsors? You you want to know a truth? You want to know a story about me backtracking for sponsors? Thanks for the thanks for the sub, Morgan Titian. Thank you. Last time a sponsor told me that I need to backtrack because of because of that, I told them no. I literally told them no. I have a sponsor. This is a true story. I had a sponsor a while ago tell me to make a public apology for something I said, and I told them no. I said no. I said I'm not doing it. Sorry. Is, is that it's a true story. This actually this happened uh, a couple of years ago where uh, one of my sponsors told me, like, you said something naughty, and you need to go and make a public apology. And I told them, I have a better idea. How about I don't make a public apology? What if I don't? How about I don't make a public... Okay, I'll tell you, like... Okay, so... Hold on, now we gotta reset the video, guys. Look at... Man. All right, I'll tell the story real quick. Okay, really, really fast. There there was a, a company that I, that I was partnered with that told me that... Um, they told me that I used, I used racist language on something because there was an argument... And I had made the statement that I do not think that the, the the word monkey is racist. Okay, I said I don't think that the word monkey is racist, and that like I, I don't I don't have a problem with people calling each other that as like because the thing is is it, it's used in a lot of context. It depends on the context, right? And uh, the context was being used wasn't even really racist. So I basically said that, and anyway. Person got really butt hurt and reported me to like literally everything. I got reported everywhere, guys. Like a full cancel. Like they, they they reported me to everything. And so my sponsors like reached out to me and they said, Leaflet, we heard you said this, and you need to make a public apology because you said this. And I said, I, I said why? And they're like, because it's racist. And I said, okay, I have a better idea. How about I'm not racist and I don't make an apology. And and they basically had this big conversation with me about how I I have to make a public apology and i basically said i'm not doing it i'm not i'm not doing it at all is is that that's basically the gist of what happened um in fact i told them actually isn't it racist for you to assume that that, that because the word monkey is used that it's referring to a certain a certain skin tone of people don't you think that's racist actually like i find that to be more racist so anyway, that's that was the story. Cause cause the thing is, is when you say the word monkey, I don't think of a specific race of people. I really don't. You know, so it, it it's the idea that like you thought I was talking about a certain race of people because I said the word monkey, doesn't that make you racist? Anyway, that's what happened. So here we go. Wokeness in video games. This has been a very popular topic for the past couple of weeks, and let's be Sorry, I have to reset it again. God damn it. Okay, guys, we're going to we're going to check out this Asmongold video, Wokeness in Video Games, and I'm actually really interested in what he has to say about it. Wokeness in Video Games. 
This has been a very popular topic for the past couple of weeks, and let's be honest, it's been a popular topic for the last decade. And today, I want to talk about why it's a popular topic. I don't feel like people really talked that about it that much, like a decade ago. Or a larger relationship. Wait, 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 decade? I mean, that was like, what? Actually, wait, never mind. Never mind. Gamergate was before that. Gamergate was before... Wow, it's been that long? Holy fuck. ...developers have with players. And I think that's really where the problem lies. I think that the issue that people have with wokeness is actually not the disease. It is just merely a symptom of the disease. And uh -huh. the actual disease is that players here in the West no longer trust development studios to make games that are authentic to a vision, that are authentic to an artistic expression, and that are authentic to a customer in a way that it's not uh, manipulative, predatory, or obnoxious in some form of way. And I think- I think that's pretty true. Again, like, I don't- I actually do believe this. I don't think that gamers are particularly racist people. In fact, I think it's the opposite. I think that most gamers, like, like, in my experience with the gaming community, sure, people say a lot of shit, like, to be edgy and to meme, but I don't think it's rooted in actual racism or any sort of hate. I think it's just people saying edgy things. Uh, I, I think gamers in general are actually pretty tolerant. I think that this is a fundamental problem that goes Yeah, right it's not even edgy, it's just funny. Of... It's just people making jokes, yeah. It's It's... It's kind of like when, you know, I hang out with my friends and then, like, you know, we just make jokes at each other over, like, whatever, like, anything, really. It's, it's kind of like that. The way that people view Western development studios. And it is a multifaceted issue, like, as I said, with monetization, with political themes, with the way that... Gamers are really sexist, though. I think it goes both ways. I think it goes both ways, but I, I have experienced, I have experienced it on both sides of that coin where I have had, I have been kicked from lobbies just for talking before. Like, like you talk and you're like, oh, it's a girl in lobby. Like everyone vote kick. Like, I've had that happen. Like for sure. I, I've definitely had that happen, but I've also seen cases where, um, people get special treatment because they're girls. Uh, take MMOs, for example, where uh, guys are more likely to help you and give you free shit because you're a girl, right? So there's, so it, it definitely does exist. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say it doesn't. Um, it doesn't exist, yeah. That games are released. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah, it's true, yeah. With bugs in games, etc. All of these things, I think that a lot of people in the West have completely lost trust in development studios, Western development studios, to accurately fulfill their needs as players, and more importantly, fulfill their needs as customers. And we're going to contrast that with a lot of times whenever Eastern studios do almost the exact same thing, and there's no problem about it at all. Which is what I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to talk about where I think this kind of comes from, and why I think people have as much of a problem with it. So the first thing that I want to talk about is monetization, because monetization is one of those... It's something that obviously everybody thinks about, but it might not really, people might not really make the connection, monetization and wokeness in video games, but fundamentally, these are just two different ways that people are communicating that they have a distrust for the developer or the publisher of a video game. Okay. So whenever, for example, a uh, Western video game has a battle pass, whenever it has any sort of other you know, pay to win features or something like that, people might get very frustrated or very annoyed with that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very fair to do that, but I also think that that frustration is very much subdued compared to people being frustrated or annoyed with development studios doing that that are Eastern. For example, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, etc. So I'll give you a really good example. It's one that's actually going on right now, is uh, Dragon's Dogma 2. Uh, Dragon's Dogma 2 has a pre-order, and if you buy the pre-order, you're able to get a number of bonuses and free little cool items. And, you know, I think there's like a ring that you get that makes your character, like, it's kind of like one of those, like, almost auto-play. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, I did pre-order the game just in case. I actually didn't know if they had anything for Dragon's Dogma, but I just pre-ordered it anyway. Because it looked good anyway. I kind of, I, I trusted, you know? type rings in Final Fantasy 16 
and I'm not sure exactly the details on it, but it is a ring that will give you an advantage in the game, at least to some degree or to some extent. And this has been met with literally basically zero pushback. Yeah, I've, I've never heard anybody say anything about this. Nobody really cares about this. Why would people care about it? Because they're excited for the game and they're very happy about it. However, mm -hmm. I do think that if an American studio did something that was similar to that, you can look at, for example, Diablo 4 and surveys that they've put out and how much people... I think they're actually... He does make a good point. I think it's because people hate Blizzard. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, people already hate Blizzard, so there's already a sense of, like, they already want to criticize Blizzard, like, by default, right? So, I can see that being the case. People have mauled it at Diablo 4 mm. even floating the idea that they're going to have anything that even remotely resembles anything like a pre-order bonus. Yeah, Blizzard broke trust too many times already. Yeah, exactly. People lost their minds over three-day early access. So whenever you get something that actually makes your character... Oh, dude, you guys remember Relink early access? Dude, huge advantage for people that had early access in Relink. Powerful. Imagine how upset Thank you, you Noah. Know now, I understand Diablo is a multiplayer game, and you know, Dragon's Dogma is a single-player game, but I actually don't think it's that big of a difference. I think that the meme of, for example, Ubisoft games having DLC on day one for single-player games, and then also these issues with other games that they have as well, with, uh, you know, paid advantages and, you know, like, uh, convenience items, even in single-player games, this is something that is actually multifaceted. This is something that's happening for Thank you for the fall. Thank you. ...in the West. And the same energy and the same frustration is not being put on developers in the East. And I think the reason why, I think there's a number of different reasons. I think one of the big reasons, though, is that uh, Western developers really like to grandstand about shit. You know what I mean? Like, Eastern developers don't really say anything. When they do... <laughs> Pause. <face>. When... <laughs> when... Uh, there we go. <laughs> but... <laughs> Okay, it's not any better. There we go. All right. But like, <laughs> Eastern developers, when they do things like this, they don't really make a big deal out of it. Whereas when Western developers, like, they they add something, they always grandstand about it. And they make like a big deal. They post it on Twitter. They post it everywhere. Um, I mean, a good example was like that that Blizzard, Blizzard diversity ch checker thing that they had where you could look at the how diverse each character was on like a chart you know what i mean like they they li they love to throw it out there and use it like it feels very marketing and it's kind of like the, in the video that i was talking about um the video about grand blue fantasy about how they have these characters that are diverse but they don't talk about it right it's it's just in the game they don't make like a big deal of like of like oh you know going out there and doing interviews yeah like we really want to add like you know this super diverse character which is why we added this and like they they love to like virtue signal it basically you know number one i think one of the big reasons is that there is a language barrier and so a lot of people don't necessarily voice their concerns or voice their complaints against the developers because they assume the developers won't understand them because they're Japanese or Chinese or something. That's so true, it's though. Really hard for them to communicate. With how them. do you even? How do you even bitch at? How do you even bitch at Square, Square Enix? Right. First off, like the, the language barrier. Second off, they probably don't give a shit. <laughs> to be to be honest, they probably don't even care. Developer, and so that's number one. And I think number two is that. This goes into a grander problem where people have a distrust for American corporations. And so the gaming community exists inside of the, it, the American gaming community and the Western gaming community exists inside of a culture that is increasingly more skeptical about capitalism. And I think also for, in some cases, very good reasons. So, for example, whenever you hear about these quarterly profits that happen on a very regular basis, and then you hear that 800 people get fired from a studio, you know, you put two and two together there, and it seems like somebody's a piece of shit, doesn't it? So, what ends up happening is that people see these things... That's just bad optics. But the problem is that optics is all that matters, unfortunately. This happen in these... Like you, don't, you don't know what happened, right? Like, like it's, it's possible that... That they made a lot of profit, but then they also realize simultaneously that like they just have too many people, and that honestly having too many people at a company can actually cost you more than just money. It can actually like really hamper development.
by having too many cooks. You know, you've you've heard the phrase "too many cooks in the kitchen." The same thing applies to video games. Western development studios, and they're basically seeing record profits. Everything's going great, and they're also seeing the employees being worked to the bone, being fired, being replaced by AI, and just everything in between. And or or you know, like one of the one of the multiple sexual abuse scandals, whether it's uh, Riot. Um, you know, Ubisoft, Blizzard, of course, Activision. Uh, one of these things is happening also. And so... I actually don't know that much about the Blizzard case. I heard it was pretty bad, though. I actually should look into it and maybe, like, watch a video on it sometime. Because I actually don't know that much. You're saying you worked at two of those? Coincidence? What ends up happening is that people just have a growing distrust for these corporations and because they have a distrust for the corporations fundamentally that distrust comes from a foundation of the companies trying to put profit above everything else so then whenever that distrust is manifested and you have oh wow it's another battle pass that expires oh boy now you've got to play the video i f i hate those so much i hate those because it forces you to play during like a very specific period and it's like Video games God, I hate hours it. a week. So people immediately have that frustration because they're looking at it from the context of American culture. And I think that, you know, if you compare it to, for example, uh, you know, the, the Japanese culture, at least it seems to be at least a little bit different. Because, for example, uh, you know, Iwata, who is one of the uh, Nintendo guys, uh, Satoru, I think, believe, uh, Iwata, uh, cut his salary as one of the executives at Nintendo. Oh, yeah, that, that actually did happen. Whenever the Wii U did not sell well. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember a uh, Western or especially an American game studio ever doing that. That's true, though. That, that actually does happen a lot in, like, the West where, I mean, all you have to do is look at politics as a good example. Um a lot of the times, like, politicians will completely fail on what they say they're going to do. And I don't even mean, like, sort of fail something, sort of fail. I mean, like, 100% unmitigated disaster fail. Uh, they'll do that, and then nothing happens to them. They just, they just get voted in again, right? Or, like, you know, someone at a company will make a big failure, and then they'll fail up. They'll, 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 they'll get promoted. And I've literally seen this happen. Like, I've actually seen this happen at a company where a person will fail at a, at a very critical task and they'll just get promoted out of there. I've seen it happen. So what the issue is, is that whenever you have an Eastern developer, people have the perception that the Eastern developer owns their failures and also owns their successes. But whenever you have a Western developer, the Western developer seemingly, uh, you know, owns their successes and makes you fund their failures. Yeah, there's like no accountability. Passes or $70 uh, horse packages in Diablo 4. So that's what ends up happening. So people are distrustful from these companies on a foundational level in terms of the way that they monetize. And that distrust comes from a greater distrust in companies inside of American culture. And of course, gaming companies are indeed companies. So people don't trust companies. They don't trust gaming companies. And then they see this monetization in the games. They see Bobby Kotick gets $200 million for uh, selling his company amidst a sexual abuse scandal. And people are like, well, this company is, is a piece of shit. And I think mm -hmm. it's pretty fair for somebody to think that, even though obviously I'm sure there's plenty of people that work there that are not, in fact, pieces of shit. So that's one of the first things that I wanted to talk about. And it's the first kind of uh, manifestation of this distrust. And the second thing that I want to talk about after this is actually bugs in games. Now, this is a very small thing, but I do want to talk about it. Uh, Final Fantasy 16 originally bugs in games like when games release i don't think it's a big deal actually i know it sounds kind of weird but like i the thing is is when the game comes out there's only a certain amount of people that are testing the game right it, there's a finite like i mean there's you know there's a small handful of people that test the game like depending on like how big the company is and like how how much qa they're they're able to afford like, these are still, like, dedicated, like, testers, right? They're, but they're still human, right? And humans can only operate for a certain amount of hours in a day, right? And because of that, when the game releases to, like, thousands of people, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people... Aside from gotcha, battle passes are worthless cosmetics. Why bother? I like, battle passes are worth... I mean, 
it's this i mean people like cosmetics i mean what do you mean why bother what do you mean why bother people people like cosmetics they want to look cool in games especially multiplayer games it's a part of like personal expression but anyway going back to what i was saying is there's a certain amount of qa people that work on the game right let's let's be generous and say 50. so let's say there's 50 qa people right you know it's usually not that big but uh once the game comes out now the game is exposed to a hundred thousand people right so there's that many more people playing the game and that more that many more people bugs uh that, that can that can experience bugs that you just didn't have the time to find because there's not that many people working in qa this is why public tests are very important like uh like betas right for, for instance but the thing is is betas also uh, pose a lot of their own problems as far as like uh you know i mean how many times have you seen it happen where a beta comes out and everyone's like oh that game's shit and then they, they don't give it a chance next time right so that has a lot of risks behind it but when there's a lot of people ex exposed to the game you're bound to find bugs that you just weren't able to find. And you're also bound to find bugs that just exist only in live service, right? There, there are times where, where there'll be a bug that's related to like the amount of people that are playing the game. Like some, you know, godforsaken reason that you couldn't have possibly seen. And, uh, you know, it just manifests itself in, in those cases. So um, 50, uh, Julio says 50 fam, that's a mid-sized team for a full game. Yeah, I was being generous. That's what I said just for illustrative purposes, like 50 is a lot. That's not even typical. But what I'm saying is even if you were to assume 50, that's still a small amount compared to the amount of people exposed to the game. Playing the game for thousands of hours, right? So that's kind of, that's kind of the issue. It's hard to catch everything. So I actually don't think a day one patch is a bad thing. In fact, I think it's it's good that you have the capability of doing that, right? You have the, you have the capability of doing that if something goes wrong. Originally said that they were going to have a patch, or sorry, they were going to have a game release with no day one patch. They were not going to need a day one patch. Everyone and hopes for that. came out, and still to this day, that is a very, very big surprise. It's almost unheard of. And you're right, it was, because they needed a day one patch. Does anybody really care about that, though? People were happy that this happened, and people always talk about day one patches and how shoddy things are for American companies. But whenever, for example, Endwalker had problems with Final Fantasy... Remember, remember Relink, guys? Relink came out and nobody could play it. Half of the people couldn't play it because it crashes. It actually messed up like our whole like uh, team going in. 14 the development or sorry the community of the game understood that this was because of a microchip shortage and because that you know covid at the time was kind of a, still a pretty big deal at the at the point especially in, in japan apparently from what i've heard and so because of that people were more understanding of what the issue was but whenever an american company has servers that go down for let's say a day or two uh people lose their fucking minds a day is a long time man and again, I think that it, another big component to this, and I want to repeat this, is that people feel like they that, that they will be able to communicate with the developers and communicate with the company directly. It's very hard to communicate with Nintendo. I, I've watched enough Smash Brothers to know that very, very well. So I think that that's also a component to it, but there's also a component of feeling like the developers at least care about the artistic integrity of the work. So whenever there is a bug or there is a problem with the game, it is assumed that this will be fixed quickly and that it will be dealt with. Whereas whenever an American company does this, I think that there is a different perception that people have with it. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is, I guess, the elephant in the room, which is the main topic of the video, is the wokeness in video games mm -hmm. and the political messaging, video, political messaging in video games. So basically, I think that there are a lot of Eastern developers that do representation in a lot of the same ways that American companies do it's true. representation. And I'll use, for example, Final Fantasy XVI. Uh, Dion, as a character, was gay. Uh, pretty simple. <laughs> gay? <laughs> well, you play the game, you're going to know that. He's a gay dude, or at least bisexual. And uh, because of that, this is a plot device in the story, and it is not, it, it, it's not super, super, it's not like if you took this out of the story, like nothing in the story would work, 
but it is it is it does have relevance and importance in the story it's not like it's a throwaway scene that's just meant to be you know throwing a, do a, a bone to the uh you know the uh, diversity guns right or diversity dogs like this is just it, it felt like it was authentic in a way and i think that that's really the word that i would want to go back to again is authenticity I think that whenever Eastern studios do this, there is a uh, assumption that they are doing it for an artistic intent. Mm -hmm. And whenever American studios do this, there is an assumption that they are doing it for a more nefarious intent. I don't think it's an assumption. Like I, 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 it actually feels like it's real in most cases that they are doing it to pander. They're doing it specifically for advertising and for monetary reasons, for some kind of like social clout gain. Like, I don't think that's a conspiracy or whatever. I think that's actually real. Whether this is to secure funding through some form of ESG, uh, who knows how true that is necessarily, but this is what people think. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how true it is or not. Mm -hmm. We're talking about perception. And, you know, truth is not always important. And ESG money was pretty big. Um, around, like a, like, a couple of years ago, it was actually, like, a pretty big source of funding. So uh, even if you were looking for funding for your new game, um, it was an easy way to guarantee that you would get funding for it. Thanks for the follow, Ketsuke. Thank you. Perception. So I don't want to hear about whether this is true or not. I think that there's a lot of people that think this. And if you go on the Internet, you will realize that this is indeed, indeed the truth to them. And so that's number one. A lot of people think that they're doing it for money. Um, number two is they're doing it to meet some sort of quota or something like that. And number three, it is developed. I, I mean, I mean, the thing is, is we have systems like that. We have, you know, speaking like strictly, uh, strictly from an American perspective, we do have systems like that. So like it, it, it's easy to make that connection and to assume that, right? Like for instance, um, we do have that kind of thing in, in colleges where they have like actual quotas for like this amount of people that join the college have to be white and this amount of people have to be black and this amount of people have to be Latin. And if it's like the numbers are off, then like we have to like just stop admitting people. And this was like a big deal actually, because this happened to a lot of Asians because um, this, this was a big thing. It was, it was actually hilarious. This happened in, in, in California where there were a bunch of people saying like, we need to end, there were a bunch of Asians that basically got together and they said we need to repeal like we need to repeal like uh, a lot of this this racial stuff at schools because it's harder for our kids to get in which is true a lot of a lot of asian kids couldn't really get into colleges because there's a high percentage of uh asians that go to college and because of that they're like whoa that's too many asians so like we need to like back that off and increase the score that you needed a higher if you were asian you needed a higher score to get into college than someone that wasn't Asian. That was actually just the truth of what happened. That's basically racism. Yeah, I, it is. It is, but they do it. They do it for reasons, and they say this is because we are not racist, right? It's because we do, we we believe that like like we we believe that um it should be diverse to the point that they actually resort to racism to make it more diverse. Does that make sense? Yeah, mm -hmm. there was actually a law in California that was um, this was recent. Actually, this is like. Uh, let me let me look it up. Um, OK, this was in 2020. See, this wasn't even that long ago, guys. This was 2020. Um, I'm trying to make sure I got this right. I, I, I don't know the actual name of it, but I'm just trying to make sure this is real. This is the one. Yeah. So there was a, uh, hold on. I think this was the one in 2020, I believe this, se this seems about right. Uh, basically there was, there's a, uh, law in, in California that said that you are not allowed to discriminate on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, national origin in public empo employment. Okay. And they wanted to repeal it. <laughs> they wanted to repeal it so that they could be racist towards people that there were too many 
like they didn't want there to be too many of a certain race working out of out of place. They wanted it to be more diverse at the cost of at the cost of uh, merit. So they tried to repeal it. Yeah. So the, the law already existed. The law was that you cannot discriminate on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity. And then they tried to repeal that law to make it legal to be racist. Does that make sense? It, luckily, it, it failed because a lot of people in you know California, they, 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 they knew what was going on. A lot of people did. Somehow it failed. And they actually like it didn't pass. So the law is still on the books. But they actually tried to repeal it. And 43% of people voted to repeal that. And it was because they wanted to be able to discriminate because right now it's illegal, right, and to, to discriminate on people. But they wanted to be able to do that so that they could get more minorities into workplaces. Does that make sense? So, yeah, th this is recent. Again, 2020, this was like not even five years ago, right? Developers inserting their personal agenda or their personal politics into the story. Now, I think all three of these things happen in American games, of course they do, but I also think that they happen in Eastern games as well. Like, for example, oh, I don't know, Metal Gear Solid. So there's a lot of examples of this happening. I heard that Metal Gear, so uh, Metal Gear Rising, was that the one I've been playing? The really, really cool one with like the, the, the really cool protagonist and it's like hella anime. Like, I heard that thing gets really political, but I, I haven't finished it yet. Eastern games but they're not met with the same degree of uh, skepticism and criticism. Now, I think there's a lot of reasons for that, and Metal Gear Solid, to be completely fair, is actually not the perfect example, because usually people have a problem whenever something is not having this type of messaging, and then it is co converted into having the messaging, whereas Metal Gear Solid was the genesis of Metal Gear Solid, was that it was politically themed. So it is slightly different, but it is not entirely different. So what I'm saying is that why is it that, for example, whenever Square Enix does this, it is seen as like, you know, Dion is like this awesome, really cool character. People love him. People think he's great. But then whenever an American company adds a character in that is gay or has some other form of, a, you know, minority status, this is somehow a problem. And I think the reason why is just straight up. People do not trust these companies to deliver an artistic vision that is authentic to. And again, it's it's their own fault. It's these companies' own fault for grandstanding so much. It like how do you trust? How do you trust that they're doing it for artistic reasons when they immediately they immediately go out there and talk about it? And you know, you have like these bad actors in like the in the, the gaming industry. Like you saw, like the sweet the sweet baby stuff. Like a lot of them were flat out racist. Right. Uh, thanks for the follow, Punk. Thank you. What their actual artistic intent is. <laughs> yeah, what's up, Zoe? Uh, this is something that's being done for some other intent other than the goal of writing or creating the best story. Mm -hmm. I think that is the number one reason. And the other reason, I think, is a little bit more... It, it, it's a little bit more nuanced, but I think as soon as you see it, it becomes obvious. So with Final Fantasy XVI... Uh, there were com uh, countries, I'm not sure exactly how many of them, I know that there was at least one, uh, that would not sell Final Fantasy 16, and it became relatively evident that the reason probably... Oh, oh, it's probably, like, who would do that? Hmm. Definitely not a Western country, I'll just say that. ...for that was because of having gay characters yep. in the story. So... What did Square Enix do in response to this? Well, they said, fuck you. I guess we're not going to sell it there. Based as fuck. Holy shit. So they actually were willing to lose money for this problem because of what their values were and uh -huh. because of holding on to their artistic integrity. Now, if you contrast this with, for example, Blizzard Entertainment. Uh <laughs> Blizzard, huh? You remember all those gay characters? I wonder if they're also gay in the Middle East. Do you guys think they are? What do you guys think? <laughs> uh, Blizzard Entertainment loves to parade around. Uh, I love my favorite, dude. My favorite is all these companies. They 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 make like their they they put like the rainbow like when it's uh 
when it's a uh, Pride Month, they put all they put like the rainbow on all of their logos, and then it's like it's like a mid the Middle East branch, no rainbow. Like fuck it, <laughs> no rainbow. Like everything else, rainbow everywhere else, and it's tolerated. You know what I mean? It, 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 uh, Kaloi, thank you so much for the follow. Thank you. It's basically like, d dude, they're they are. <laughs> they are uh real allies right like these the, these companies they're real allies as long as it's easy and profitable right as long as it's easy and profitable we're your ally right the instant it becomes the instant it's like it's you know there's a little bit of pushback ah, i don't know we can't do it anymore you know it's kind of like all of the, like a lot of the companies too that are like you know oh yeah you know we stand you know you know black history month we stand against like you know like like you know we want reparations for slavery like meanwhile meanwhile paying money to like actual countries that have slaves <laughs> like it's it, it's people, it's so crazy uh, sexualities of people the different uh you know like the different races of people uh women's diversity etc in these different uh videos that they do and they like making posts about this and you know basically Send from a slave produced iphone tools. i know but whenever it comes down to it the Overwatch League, I'm pretty sure, is in uh, is in Saudi Arabia now. Wait, and it so is Overwatch that... League is in Saudi Arabia. Is that real? Overwatch League, Saudi Arabia. Blizzard announces new era uh, of Overwatch uh, esports with the Overwatch uh, what's it Champion Series, uh, Saudi funded partnership. Interesting. You know the one that really weirds me out? And again, I'm not really trying to make a political statement here in terms of, like, what I believe in in this case. But one thing that really is quite interesting to me is I've seen a lot of people on Twitter uh, post things like, like, queers for Palestine, like LGBT for Palestine things. And I'm like, wouldn't they kill you if you were there like i just i just find that to be so interesting because like if you were there you're like the first people they're killing it just doesn't make sense to me a very interesting situation and so whenever i see this kind of stuff happen you can clearly see that this company does not really have any morals or does not really like it, have it all the, the problem values. and you know like asmin's onto something here the whole thing is it feels fake do you know what i mean like the entire thing just feels fake like it 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 it, it reeks of like people not actually understanding what they believe in and just saying shit just to like just for like internet points basically they're just saying shit they don't even think about what they're saying. It's literally like you say the thing, you, you you say the thing, you bend the knee, and everyone gives you a little pat on the head. You know what I mean? And that's really what it feels like. And I think that that's what really makes people distrust these American companies is because whenever these companies have nothing to lose, they have no problem advertising and talking about how much they care about different minorities or protected groups. But the moment that it can actually cause them to lose money or the moment that these people are actually their employees that need better treatment, somehow this is a lot different. And you have to understand that, you know, you know, global markets and, you know, like cultural relevance and everything like that. And the reality is that, you know, Blizzard has literally no problem literally erasing gay people like I'm sure Soldier 76 and Tracer are probably not gay whenever they do the Overwatch League. They're not communicated in the same way in media over there. Yeah, probably not. Probably not. Because of that, it's the same as they are here because obviously of the culture over there. And these companies are willing to bend the knee to cultures that are by the definition of their... Is bend the knee from like Game of Thrones? Is that where it came from? I, I know that they say it in Game of Thrones, but is that where it came from? Because I feel like everyone uses that term now. Is that because... Of is that because of Game of Thrones? I feel like it is. It's not? Okay. It's really old. Okay. Okay. Their own, by their own definition of what they stand for, completely antithetical to what... I like it. It's a good term. It sounds It sounds good. Thanks for the follow, Akash, though. Thank you. Are, but it doesn't matter to them because they can stand to make money off of it, and so they do it.
And I think that this is, and I, I want to address also another thing, because again, you're seeing these companies that will just do this. And I think also it would be okay if they did this. It's almost like you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can have your cake or you can eat it, but you can't have both. So what ends up happening is that you have these companies that like to, you know, on Pride Month, change all of their stuff to a rainbow. But then oh my God, that, he's literally going to talk about you it. Know, you look at what is their what is their brand for different areas in the world. Well, they didn't change any of these other brands. They're just changing it for like, you know, the more Western. Yeah, all the time. This happens all the time. Ones. So and, and why is that? Well, that's obviously because they don't want to alienate people in that group. So it's like, do you really believe in this or are you just. Yeah, it feels fake as fuck, right? Using this as a tool for marketing. And I think that really, whenever you see things like the Overwatch League going to Saudi Arabia and Overwatch Esports going into the Middle East, it becomes very evident that Blizzard does not actually have any values outside of money. I would respect it way more if Blizzard just said, like, you know, fuck it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're gay. We're gonna, you know, if you guys don't want, we won't, we won't, we won't, we won't be in your country. I mean, that's, that seems like way, way better, I think. And... I think that that's also another very big factor is that you compare that with Square Enix, who is willing to, again, lose money for their values. And it's not even losing money for your values. It's losing money for the artistic integrity of your product. You have to fundamentally change your product in order to adhere to somebody else's social norms. So your art is not good enough to exist on its own. Now it has to be modified, altered, and fundamentally censored in order for it to meet a, you know, in a lot of ways, a uh, reductive cultural standard. Obviously, they can do things however they want, but, um, you know, I don't necessarily agree with that. But again, if you're making games like this and you're selling them over there, I don't want to hear about how much you care about gay people. Yeah, like, exactly. Straight mm -hmm. up, that's, this is insane. And so these companies are, are using these different people as basically a tool for marketing. And I, I want to address a concern that a lot of people might have or a comment that a lot of people might have is that it doesn't matter that they're doing this because even whenever they provide this type of representation, it is still a net good. I don't and think so. I completely disagree with it. Mm -hmm. And I want to explain why I disagree with it. The reason why I disagree with it is because basically what ends up happening is you take a pure ideal, you know, and I'm not saying pure as in terms of like, completely good, but is pure in terms of it being untainted by any sort of outside entity, whether the yeah, exactly. new, is new backup. capitalism, it's hollow. communism, uh, you know, gay rights, gun rights, anything like that. You take an idea that is a pure idea, and then what ends up happening is that this company tries to attach their brand to this idea to use this idea as a marketing tool for their brand. Um, oh, I see. If you've ever seen the way that parasites infect bugs, <laughs> uh, this is actually... The companies are parasites. <laughs> so they are effectively parasitic on these social issues because they are using these social issues as a tool for marketing. And in the process of that, they are polluting these social issues with their own brand. Product. That's interesting. That's an interesting way to think about it. Is that because of that, now, now the brand is attached to it. So all of the... like. When the brand does something distrustful and they they break the trust of the gamers, like it is then blamed or or attached to also the movement that they were behind. Problems because a lot of times the companies that are using these social issues as effectively marketing tools do not have pristine reputations. I think again, Blizzard is the best example of this. So you have Blizzard who's had multiple scandals, sexual you know, allegations, scandals, uh, this like weird stuff, uh, you know, it, it doesn't help too that like the t timing wise. And again, I don't know what the, I don't know what the relationship is. And if there's like an actual metric that we can use to like combine like the two to figure out like what's actually, if it's actually true or not. But the perception is that like Blizzard was a really great company, right? And it just so happened that around the time that they started doing all of this kind of like woke pandering stuff, it really started to go downhill. And again, I'm not saying there's a direct correlation. I don't know that. But like it does add to the perception that, and again, like what Asman said, perception is what matters, right? And it adds to the perception that that whole thing of the whole wokeness thing 
is correlated with the downfall of the company, right? And it, it does create that that perception, regardless of if it's true or not. Deleting the, you know, the gay people. Thank you for the follow, up, Petikoff. Thank you. The world and all of these other kinds of issues, not to mention issues that are inside of their own games that they took them over ten years to fix. Uh, these are all problems. I mean, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I mean, there's there's a lot of gay in Grand Blue, and it's they're doing they're doing great. That, that have been going on for a long time. And so then whenever you you see them doing this and you see this issue, I think that a lot of people take the issue less seriously. And the mental messaging of that is that this issue is not legitimate and they are delegitimizing and making people skeptical of the issue because the company is attaching themselves to the issue and people are actually skeptical of the company. That's an interesting way to think about it. Issue through basically, you know, like logical cause and effect. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I find it to be so bad whenever these companies do this and they do it in a cynical and self-serving and profit-driven way. I don't have a problem with a company that wants to stand on business like Square Enix and say, hey, this is what we believe in and we're willing to lose money on it. But I, I think a lot of people would think that that would that, that'd be an honorable thing to do. In my opinion, whenever I see a company that has values that they will not com or that w they will compromise for money, well, then you don't really have values. You just more or less want have money. <laughs> uh, different marketing tactics. Don't you? Yeah. And I think that's really the main, most cynical thing about it is the fact that these different social issues, I think, for a lot of gamers, and I find it to be very disappointing to see it whenever I'm watching like a new trailer on my stream and there's, oh my God. There's a fucking black person. Oh my god, there's a woman. And then I see my chat stream and I'll read YouTube comments. It's not just my community, guys. There's a lot of people that think this. And and everybody is spamming woke. They're like, oh That's true. That actually that kind of thing does happen. A woke game, woke game. Oh no, another girl protagonist, everything like this. You're like, I don't have anything against girl protagonist. I love it when there's a girl protagonist. I love it. But it's like it's always it feels so fake in a lot of these games. Right, and, and I mean, the, I mean, you don't see people getting pissed off about, um, like, it's a new game that's out that has like a like a female protagonist. It's that one sexy girl game, and then there's, uh, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Stellar Blade, yeah, I can't think of like another one off the top of my head that had like a that had like a. There's a lot though. It's just I'm just having a little brain fart right now, but. Twitter hates Stellar Blade. Yeah, near. I don't. I don't know. But I don't think people see a female protagonist. Like, I don't think people dislike it really. And I think that all of this, you know? is contributed into a. Ma but major I feel problem. like you can tell, though. I feel like you can tell. <laughs> oh man, I don't know how much I want to go into that, but. I, I feel like you can tell, you can, you can tell when it's made for those reasons. You know what I mean? When it's made for like the, the Yas Queen Slay, like Yas, Yas Queen Slay, very diverse po woman power. Like you can tell when it's that kind of character and you can tell when it's not. And I think people have a problem with the latter and not, you know. Which is lack of trust of the developer on a fundamental level. And so hopefully I've illustrated kind of like where these problems come from, whether it's coming from monetization, whether it's coming from uh, communications, whether it's coming from game development, whether it's coming from the way that the companies address bugs. I think that there has been a massive disconnect. See, The Last of Us 2. Okay, so I don't think that people are necessarily... So, so I, I haven't played The Last of Us, but from what I can gather from what people have told me, it seems like the problem that people have with The Last of Us 2 is that they took a beloved character from the first series and like gutted him completely. F only for the purpose of making the female characters look better. Uh, that's what I heard. I don't know if that's true. But yeah, that's that's why I heard people are pissed off because it's like, oh, you know, it, it kind of similar again to what they did with Luke Skywalker, right? They took Luke Skywalker in Star Wars, they fucking gutted him just to make room for like, you know strong strong woman character super 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 female never do anything wrong like 100 percent perfect they like always do that to the to these things 
and like a lot of people, you know, they grew up loving Luke Skywalker and they freaking gutted the man just just for the whole reason of like, well, he's not the cool one. It's Ray, right? Like that's what happened. Between what the and you know, people like, hate I that say American, but like really, it's Western pop. Take for example, if you made another series, like if you put Ray and you put her into another, a completely different series, you took her out of Star Wars, you put her in something else, people would probably still not like her because she's kind of, you know, she's. It's a little Mary Sue, a little bit, a little bit, you know, unbelievable, you could say, as a character. But I don't think she would be hated to the level that she's hated now. I feel like she's hated, like, even more because of that. Because of what happened with Luke Skywalker. I think if you put her isolated in another thing, the hate levels would go down, I think. population wants his players... And what the uh, what the studios are at least communicating. Thanks for the follow, Corpse. Thank you. In terms of their messaging, in terms of the way that they develop games, and also in terms of like how they market these games, because whenever these games are, are, are using these social issues to market themselves, and then just suddenly ignoring them in these other different uh, parts of the world where the social issues aren't as popular, you can clearly see that the social issue is not something that the company actually holds value in. It's just, well, it is something the company holds value in, but that value is monetary and not uh, idealistic or mm -hmm. principle driven. And so I think that one thing that people have to keep in mind is that every single time that a company does that and they attach themselves to one of these issues and people can clear, clearly see that there are inconsistencies or that they're doing this, this, this thing because they're trying to like make money and they're not doing it or, you know, like affording to lose money on it. Um, this is something that I think will cause people to have a distrust or a dislike for the issue itself. And I think that we've seen that happen. Like, for example, whenever you see these games that come out and, uh, you know, everybody says, oh, my God, it's a woke game. A lot of cases, it's necessarily not a woke game, but it's just a game that has, like, you know, a female protagonist. But look at, for example, Stellar Blade. Stellar Blade is coming out. Now, obviously, the girl's really hot, and so... <laughs> Kind of she's very hot. Entirely. She's got like. But it's very clear. She's that got that ass, don't you know. Have a problem with female protagonists, but they do have a problem whenever it's a Western studio. You didn't crazy. Final Fantasy have a female protagonist? Like, had a bunch of them, right? Like, uh, they had lightning. I don't think anyone said anything about that. Nobody cared. Yeah, yeah. I think people had other issues with the game, but I don't think lightning was the problem. Being a certain type of female protagonist. Tara, I mean, y Yuna was in X2, right? And this, there's been a lot of a lot of female characters, like like dude, Samus. Samus was female since the first game, like the the the, the, the original like NES game. You could play Samus without her armor, right? Like the zero suit Samus, you could play her in the first game. That feels like it is a you know, critique on modern society. And I think that that's something that, in general, people become fatigued by. And as soon as people start seeing the man behind the machine, the willing suspension of disbelief is removed. The Samus is cool. Cool character. And people see different things in the game as representations of real-life goals and real-life political, uh, you know, messaging. And then that sense of escapism that they get out of the games is removed. So I think that all of these things, again, contribute to a general distrust for Western developers on a wholesale level. And I think that we're seeing this happen in real time, and we've been seeing this happen in the last five years, and things have just deteriorated, and there's no reason for me to assume that they- I'm not gonna lie, like, uh, Asmin's room looks very comfy. Like, the setup of it. I feel like I feel like uh, I would be comfortable in a room like that. Things will stop deteriorating. Like for example, is here's another small example that just occurred to me. Um, Elden Ring had the body type A and body type B for men and women that a lot of games use now instead of using male and female. And nobody ever brought this up or cared about it. Mm -hmm. But whenever an American company has this, there's at least. I mean, to be fair though, American companies they don't. I feel like they go a little further than that. I, I think so. Like, I don't know. I'd say probably 10 times more people talking about it. So, again, it's about people thinking that what they're seeing 
is not authentic. It's what people are people are seeing that's not real. It's not uh, you know what the art artist like wants it to be, and it's being created as a for profit amalgamation of different goals, focus groups, and profit motives, and you know KPIs that this game is supposed to create, rather than just being a cohesive um, you know experience that a person can go through. And so I wanted to make this video and talk about it because we're having a lot of conversations about woke things in video games. But I actually think that the woke things in video games, in some cases, is simply just perceived. And it's not always just woke if there's a girl or another minority in the game. And I think that Final Fantasy 16 proves that very clearly a lot of gamers actually do not believe that. But in fact, people just don't trust Western studios mm -hmm. with anything. And I think this even goes farther, and they don't trust Western uh, games media with anything. And I don't... ...poisoned at the moment that there's no end in sight. ...would stop using social issues to market themselves, and companies would stop making statements about social issues whenever the company isn't willing to uh, lose money on the social issues. Mm -hmm. And also sometimes I think companies use support of social issues as a way to whitewash previous controversies, which I think not only um, you know seems extremely fake, but it also hurts the social issue because again, it pollutes the social issue with the brand and the, uh, uh, the different like basically- Yeah, I didn't really think about that. That's an interesting way to look at it. Thanks for the follow, Meiji. Thank the you. Reputation of that company. So I would really like to see that stop. And I, I think that nobody has a problem with a company that's willing to, you know, have a real value and is willing to lose money on that value. But I think people are tired of seeing companies that clearly, clearly do not have these values and they're just using them as tools for marketing. And I think that that's represented in terms of many things with gaming nowadays. And I just wanted to make a video and talk about this. Hopefully it wasn't too long. Hopefully you guys can see where my perspective is. And I think that again, uh, the wokeness and people perceiving this in game. Aren't a lot of people hating on Asmund right now for, for this shit? <laughs> I swear a lot of people are like saying he's like racist and shit and they fucking hate him because of like his takes. This is a very, like this take isn't even that crazy. This is a very uh, understandable take. I think most people can re relate to this, honestly. Yeah, it's very level-headed. Like, I don't get it. What's, what's, the, what's the thing? That's so weird. He just thinks, yeah, true. That's crazy, actually. And if you guys want to check, uh, check it out, he's been releasing a lot of these kind of videos lately about, uh, about this sort of thing. Um, there's the link if you want to give it a thumbs up uh, and share the video and stuff with your friends. I think it's a very, uh, it's very good, very good video on the topic.